Welcome to this week's podcast episode. I brought on Stefanos Safanda. Stefanos, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful for Instagram. You know, sometimes social media, it's like, is it your friend or foe? But without those kind of avenues, we wouldn't have connected. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Where do you live and what do you do? Yeah, so I'm based in Southern California and I love love. So <laughs> anything to do with love uh, at either a physical level, so how we interact with each other to something that's more conceptual, deeper, esoteric, philosophical, cosmic. I just love love. So I, I play and I, I uh, serve in the realm of relationships and healthy masculinity. You know, I'm a big advocate of healthy masculinity in contemporary times and what that means. And I have no doubt that we'll, we'll di dive into that in some capacity at least. Um, but I, I've just been fascinated for quite some time. What does it mean to be a man in today's world? And how does that not only affect us as men and how does it affect me as an individual, but how does it affect the people in our lives and humanity as a whole? And so really looking at optimizing relationships, our relationship to self, our relationship to ideas, to people, to earth, to intimate romantic partnerships. How can we just optimize the health of anything that we decide to venture into because we're relational beings. So how can we get the best out of ourselves in that space? Well, and then I think is, isn't the, the, percentage now of divorces I think it's over 50% at this point mm. so maybe mm. it's stepping into a space of either not rushing in or I hate this term but not settling or <laughs> taking doing enough self-care so you're ready and available to be a part of a relationship yeah. I, I think it's so many things so many so many variables that come into play when we can look at the divorce rates or statistics and we can say okay let's just say first all of first marriages are at the moment ending um, about 55% divorce rate. And we can look at those statistics and we can say, okay, what's responsible for that? Is it something to do socioeconomically? Is it structurally? Is it monogamy? Is that the issue? Is that the problem? Is it that we're getting married too early? Is it that we're getting married too late? Is it, what, what are the issues? And so there's so many variables that affect that. Essentially, we have to strip all of that back and just begin with who we are as individuals. We begin with ourselves. We make decisions. We live in such a fast-paced world. We live in such a quick fix, uh, short-term gratification world that some of the decisions that we make, they need a little bit of time. They require longer, longer assessment. And I'm not talking about a cognitive assessment. That's maybe part of it. But more so just really getting clear on what we want as human beings really being clear on what's important to us, what are our highest values, what can we bring to a relationship, and then just being observant of what, what is the other bringing to the relationship, how transparent and, and open is our communication. There are so many variables that affect relationships ending up not being together and breaking apart. And so when we begin with ourselves on just gaining clarity on what we want, we then actually begin to magnetise an alignment in that we mirror that we bring that into our lives it's not always going to be roses and rainbows and unicorns but at least at a fundamental values level we can meet somewhere that is of substance and resonance and that's i think a very important start to have in any relationship knowing self essentially for sure uh, to share a little bit about my background, I was engaged to be married about three and a half years ago. Long story short, I called it off two months before the wedding. It was a tough time, but I'm so glad I went through that experience to now realize the things I thought I wanted versus what do I really want. Mm. And I, I want to share, um, first of all, congratulations. I know you're recently um, mm. engaged, so congrats. Thank you. Thank but you. you had quite a journey to get to this point. So can you mm. share? you know, where you came from to get to where you are today? Yeah, I, I lived a life of very deep confusion. And it didn't appear that way on the surface, though. I did, I, I did a very efficient and effective job of hiding that from the world and wearing many a mask to, to really trick myself, essentially, and trick others into thinking that I had it all together. But I didn't have it all together. I was living in doubt and confusion. I was living in fear. I was living in apprehension of what I really wanted and what I was attracting in my life. I was living in fear of letting people down. And by default, what I actually did was let people down because I wasn't being truthful. Mm 
And in not being truthful, I didn't give people in my life, particularly the women in my life at an intimate romantic level, the opportunity to make decisions based on truth. I would simply just be telling stories. And what I mean by that is I believe the stories that I was telling them and I was telling myself that I really wanted to be in relationship or I was ready to be in relationship. And I was unfaithful in those relationships. I was scared in those relationships. I had, I had fears around being constricted and I had fears around commitment and fears around my freedom being taken away from me or what I perceived to be freedom. I had so much fear in the way I was living life and I was so erratic in my behavior. I was burn, build, burn, build. I was like that with my businesses. I was like that with my relationships. I was like that in my own mind. I was very erratic and, and, and so fast paced, but in, in an almost chaotic way. And so for me, that, that all unraveled itself and, and really came to a head and a stop when a number of years ago uh, I was with my partner and she discovered that I was being extremely unfaithful in that relationship and very dishonest and, and not really present to the relationship. I would be speaking to how present I was, but I wasn't acting in that way and I was living in my shadow self and it, it perpetuated a, a story and action within me. And so that became the norm for me, it became the norm to continue to live in the shadow to say one thing to tell her that yep i'm here yes i want a life with you yes i want to be married yes i want all these things but inside me parts of me wanted that but inside me i was so scared of that and and so not present to what her needs were that i would behave completely different in when i was on my own and so it wasn't until she discovered that I was able to really witness the pain that I, my actions had caused her and us and the separation that was taking place that I made a decision to stop being that person and really go deep into all of my behaviour and all of my belief systems and all of my childhood wounding and trauma. And not to use that as an excuse for my behaviour, it was just that that was majorly, what was responsible for my behaviour was me not being willing to do the work to equilibrate and neutralize those previous pains and traumas and, and, and fear-based experiences that I'd latched onto and experienced as a kid. And when I decided to do that work and really look at all of that and look at the wholeness of who I was being and where I was coming from, that's when my life radically shifted and radically changed. So ultimately, your fears and doubts of not feeling enough and, and the childhood trauma led to self-sabotage. And I believe so many of us do that without maybe realizing that's mm. what we're doing. Yeah. So when you had the realization, what were the steps you took to change things around? Mm. Once, I, once I began to allow myself to feel these painful feelings and to actually go through the fear, mm. which was very extremely overwhelming, I made the choice to, to see a counsellor. I engaged in psychological services, in spiritual healing. I sought mentors and teachers. I spent a great deal of time being with myself, meditating, uh, engaging in abstinence, engaging in being, being alone. And, and I want to say isolating myself, although that was part of it. And, that, and that, that got to a point where it was unhealthy because that became, and that, again, that was learning in and of itself. That became another extreme uh, example. I thought if I isolate myself then I can't hurt anyone and I can't hurt myself. And of course that was again, fear-based thinking. So it took me time to move through that. But essentially I did, I engaged in self-help and self-care practices as well and really began to look deeply at everything that I was being and why was I doing what I was doing? I started to just really unpack and debunk all of my actions and all of my thoughts as much as I could, of course, there's, there's just so many. Um, we have thousands and thousands, at least 50,000 thoughts a day to debunk every single one. I mean, most of them are repetitive, but to debunk every single thought is not quite possible, I would think. healing past relationships relationships with my primary caregivers with both of my parents relationship with my brother just I went really deep into those into the childhood wounding that I experienced I experienced physical and emotional abuse as a child 
I went back into that to really examine how that was affecting my life in the present. I looked at my behavior, my aggressive behavior, my frustrations, my agitations, my tension that I was experiencing. I went back into my childhood when I would be a very passive, weak child where I was really hiding from the world. And I started looking at those behaviors and how, when they formed during my formative years, how did that actually affect who I was as an adult? So I, like I said, I went, I went pretty deep into, into that space and over, over a longer period of time. And I sought help. Like I really did sit, seek help and I did a lot of it and chose to do a lot of it on my own because I wanted to be self-reliant and responsible and to take ownership for my actions and ownership for the states that I was occupying. It's amazing the work you've done. Something you touched on earlier is uh, freedom, freedom in a relationship. And I actually, I attended, um, I'll just say it, I don't care, a Tony Robbins event. It was one of the most, I've been to many. Tony Robbins is okay. I love cool. him. I, yeah, love I like him. him too. I think he's great. <laughs> but one of the seminars I went to, we spent an entire day on relationships and the mm. the meaning behind feminine and masculine energy. And it has nothing to do with our what society has pushed on us, what that means. But what I learned in that, and he did this exercise and the men in the room stood up and yelled, freedom. It was so powerful for these guys kind of to step in to be a warrior and uh, that ultimately men want to serve and protect and whatever. But what yeah. does freedom mean to you in a relationship? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a question I ask people often. And I ask myself as well. And so I'm going to answer that question in a couple of different ways. And the first thing that I'm going to say is hashtag freedom through commitment. I think that's really, I think that's a really cool hashtag. And I don't know um, in what context it exists in the ether, but I think it's a really cool hashtag. And so I discovered free. I was so scared of commitment. I was so scared of my freedom, my ability to do what I want, how I wanted, when I wanted to be taken away from me. And I associated that with being in a relationship, being in an intimate, romantic, monogamous relationship. And the reason for me as to why I made those very deep neural visceral associations was because I witnessed a very unhealthy, uh, toxic relationship growing up. My primary relationship of, of, of what was a model of a relationship being my parents. And I associated marriage and togetherness and, and, and intimacy and, and relationship with, what well, is that what it's going to be like? My mother was always going on about, how difficult my father was and how restricted she felt and that she felt her life was taken away from her. She would verbalize these things and she was coming from her own pain. It's not, this isn't a, an external blame or shame. And my father, when my father was at home, they would be fighting and abuse. And it's just, so my idea of what a relationship was, the moment I would talk about marriage or deeper intimacy or deeper commitment with my partner, unconsciously I was just being triggered. And so I didn't feel free. I didn't feel free at all. And so for me, in order to feel free, I sought other women. I felt free in that. I, felt, I didn't feel like I was being annihilated. And so the moment I did my work around that, the moment I went into that and really owned that and realized that it was my past that was dictating my present and ultimately my future, I didn't feel constricted in relationship anymore. I could make choices and be honest. I could speak my truth and posture my truth and not feel abandoned or rejected around it because I started healing the wounds around my abandonment and my rejection and my humiliation. And so I could be me and know not to take it personally. I could be me. And so I was having this conversation today. I was having this conversation today with a friend of mine. And in fact, this very similar conversation last week with another friend of mine, I was speaking about rejection. Are we ever truly rejected? Well, you think about this for a moment. At a superficial level, sure, maybe we're being rejected by someone. They're not seeing us in the way we wish to be seen or perceived to be seen. We wish to perceive ourselves to want to be seen. Maybe that's happening, but there's so much that's occurring unconsciously at a, at a biological and visceral level in the body. I mean, we make up our minds whether we like someone, whether we magnetize to them, i.e. are they safe or unsafe, i.e. are they a worthy sexual partner or not, i.e. are they a worthy parent of our child or not. We make these decisions unconsciously within seconds without us even consciously being aware of it. And so from that, and that's based on so many different variables, on our interpretations of the world growing up, on, on our implicit memories, which are 
almost infinite on our models of reality, our belief systems, our environment, our culture, our values, so much, so much comes into that. And so are we ever really being rejected when people are making decisions about us? Not really even based on who we are or what we're doing, but more importantly, what, the, what their experience of life is based on, on their own personal subjective experience. And so once I really began to understand that and realise that, wow, I don't have to be scared of this rejection. And I, I really did some deeper work around healing the past that I had experienced, the rejection that I had perceived I had experienced in the past. I was able to be truthful and honest with who I was and what I wanted and not take it so personally, then also give people an opportunity to really make decisions from a place of knowing, not from a place of pretend, not from a place of, oh, he's saying this, I'll take what he's saying for, for truth, but really I wasn't in the past. And so for me, that was freedom. It was being able to make those choices and not, and not being, not, my choices not being hindered by ooh, the pain of abandonment or possible rejection or humiliation is too much. I better lie and let them hear what they, what I think I want them to hear, what they want to hear. Therefore, I'll be safe. The little boy inside me will be safe. I call bullshit. I call bullshit on that, and I worked through that process and moved through that. And for me, I mean, freedom is an interesting concept. I do feel free in the decision making that I have. I also know that there are constraints in our in our world that. We claim to be free, but are we free? I also understand that no matter what is happening in our outside environment, we have a choice in how we respond to that. And that in and of itself is a, is a, a posturing of freedom as well. I have to ask you something. So what is your immediate response when I say, happy wife, happy life? <laughs> That's my immediate response. It, it, it's nice and it rhymes. Uh, hey, the, the, my immediate response is, I want to say somewhat codependent, but, <laughs> but, but of course, um, the reality is that whatever is occurring in our, our, in our environment, in our physical environment, in our relationships, in the people, geopolitically, socioeconomically, culturally, et cetera, it does affect how we feel and it does affect how we feel about life. But if we allow how people feel about themselves to affect how we feel about ourselves, that's unhealthy because then what we're doing is we're validating our self-worth and our sense of self and our happiness based on what's happening outside of us, which really we can't completely, we can't really control. We can only master how we feel within ourselves and how, what we bring to the world. And so I would think that if someone is in a marriage, we would want genuinely want if in fact any relationship where you care about someone this should, I don't know, like the word should, but it's healthy to want the other person to be happy and to be content. And a healthy individual understands that that's not always going to be the case 24 hours a day. And it's okay if another person gets upset. And just because they're upset, it doesn't mean that we have to be upset. See, something that I'm learning and I've learned and I'm continuing to learn is that if my, if my spouse, if my fiance is not happy, me being not happy and mirroring that, doesn't make the situation better. Now, if I'm unhappy for my, my specific reason, sure, I can own that and step into that. But if I'm just going to be unhappy because my fiance is, then am I really helping the situation? No, not necessarily. So for me, what's really important is that we, we choose the emotions that we want to express and feel based on what's going on within us. And there's definitely learning and growth in all of that. But if, we're, if, if everything that our intimate partner feels, we're also feeling, and we're not really doing anything about that that's constructive, then I don't think we're in a, in a growth state in any capacity. I mean, I think that was a fair response. The reason I brought it up, um, and I've actually brought it up in a past podcast dealing with relationships, I just, I feel like it's such a cop-out and it kind of, it, that saying happy wife, happy life, I believe makes women look like these big controlling bitches and men just doormats. And I just, I don't yeah. think that's how relationships should be. Where's the sovereignty? Where's the autonomy? Where's the, where's the individuals that are, are coming together to definitely be to, 
for me, a healthy relationship is a two whole, if we're talking about a normative, a normative uh, heterosexual male or female relationship, and you can apply this to any, any dynamic, any type of relationship, it's people coming together that feel whole, that come together to enhance their lives and evolve their lives. I think that's a, that's a, that's a massive component of being in a conscious relationship or engaging in, in something called sacred union where the, the union that you're coming to, together in and for is really to evolve each other's lives, but you're coming in feeling whole, feeling connected. And so if, if it's a happy wife, happy life, it's like, or it, there's nothing wrong with serving your wife. There's nothing wrong with being of service to the world. Absolutely, I'm a massive advocate, advocate of that on so many levels for so many reasons. And we have to have our own sovereignty and our own autonomy, especially for men. Men need to be able to step into healthy posturing of leadership and autonomy, be self-responsible, be self-reliant, and really move through the world coming from a space of congruent integrity, where their insides are matching the outsides. So their thoughts, their emotions, their feelings are matching and mirroring the, the behavior, the attitude, the way they relate outwardly. Very, very important for all of us. Yes. And I, I mean, we could dive so much deeper into this entire mm. topic, uh, I think, honestly, for hours. I love mm. this stuff. Mm. But for time's sake, uh, yeah. I do have some rapid fire questions for you to kind of wrap this up. Yeah. Um, what is a quote or motto you live by? Be willing. And you share that with me, willingness. What does that mean? For me, it covers anything and everything. Be willing to explore, be willing to look at the shadow, be willing to do the hard work, be willing to move through the fear and the pain, be willing to explore the unknown, be willing to celebrate our joys and our, our bliss and our achievements. Simply just be willing to be present to whatever's arising in the very now moment. Be willing. Without, without, without harsh critique and judgment, without being constricted with fear, just be willing. I love that. What is a book you're currently, currently reading or highly recommend? Uh, Bhagavad Gita. What is that? The Gita is the, I don't want to say primary Hindu spiritual text, but it's, it's a major spiritual text of um, Hindu religion and spirituality. Okay. Something new for me. I will check that out. Yeah, Gita, G-I-T-A. What advice would you give your younger self? Oh, so much. Uh, <laughs> I would want to say be willing again. And, and, and in this context specifically, is, is probably outside of be willing is don't run. Don't run away from what's presenting itself. I ran away for too long, avoiding and isolating myself. And I, was, I ran for too long. So just... No need to run. Just be present to whatever is unraveling here and now. And final question. What's next on your bucket list? Oh, oh I'd like to visit Iceland is, my, is what's next on my bucket list. Yeah. To see the Northern Lights or what, what do you want to, to see? see the Nor to see the Northern Lights and just to explore the country, to explore that land. Yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to do in the very near future, which I will do in the near future. Good. I, I do want to ask, so your mission and the message that you're spreading, what, what do you really want men and women? How can we be more supportive for our partners? What do you want us to take away? Yeah. Is the, the most important lesson I have learned in being in deep, intimate relationship is not being triggered when our partner is being triggered. I, I, I've been that person before and I see it too often when our partners in pain or even behaving from a place of fear or pain, what I've done in the past so much is I've met that with fear and pain and it doesn't go anywhere healthy. And, and over time that compounds and couples say, Hey, we're not suited for each other. And the reality is that's not always the case. And so when your partner is meeting you with fear and pain, can you hold? Can you be present to that and know that it's not you, not allow your old stuff to come up, your old fear and pain, because you feel at some level you're being threatened. 
meet that with compassion and empathy and understanding and patience and holding and strength and verticality, especially for men. And, and honestly, observe what happens when you do that. And you do that enough times, their pain and fear dissipates because that's one of the purposes of being together in relationship. That's how we grow. And then they naturally do it for you. And that's where healing takes place. That's where breakthroughs, mental, emotional, spiritual breakthroughs take place, relational breakthroughs take place. So that's a, that's a big thing for me. Big, big thing. Yes. I love the work you're doing and the message you're spreading. So thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.